rooms, it's a part of the general's house, Herod's general house. Why is that? We don't really know that it was belongs to the general, but it's the biggest house that is not the pal one of the palaces. So we're assuming that it was general. Again, we didn't find here a sign that says, welcome to Herod's general's house. Um, but I want to show you a couple of things. First of all, you can see around you the, the plaster and the frescoes. Fresco, it's a painting on the wet plaster. Now look, about the plaster. 2,000 years ago, they used to plaster in only two cases. The first case is a matter of a cistern. You remember I explained to you what is a cistern. You have to plaster it from the inside to keep the water in. The second, the second thing, one, two. The second thing is the palace of the king, of the emperor, of the most important person in the kingdom. A guy like Herod, for instance, okay, or the empire of, uh, of Rome, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Herod loved plastering everything, everything, everything from the smallest room to the warehouses to the, the whatever you can think about. But this house, because it was special, because it was the general's house, he had also those frescoes, as you can see over here. When you are painting on a wet plaster, when the color is going in, it stays for much, much longer because it's getting dry together with the, uh, uh, with the plaster. But just that you'll understand, to plaster a room like that, although it was gen the general's house, let's say that if you have, I don't know, a dog house the, 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 uh, in the backyard from wood, something simple, and you'll plaster it. And not only that, those frescoes, it's like that you'll buy a Picasso and you'll put it in your dog's house. It's something that you can do, but I don't really see you guys do that. <laughs> so, uh, from some reason. So, this was the way uh, he did, but that's the way he loved it. Now, guys, you see the black line? Yeah. Everything that below the black line is a replica. Everything that above it is original. Come on, guys. Listen to what I'm saying. It's the other way around. Whatever that is, whatever that is below it is original. Above it is a replica. Okay? Oh, I'm checking that you're listening to me. Like, uh huh, uh huh. Yeah, just, come on, please. But guys, listen. It doesn't mean that we found it exactly like that. Because after the archaeologists are digging in different places, the tourist department is coming and making everything ready for the tourists. Because the way that we found it, let's do, say that I would do something like that, it would probably uh, be falling down. And except that tourists love, love taking souvenirs back home with them. <laughs> How everyone would take something small and then would show it to his neighbor. So after that, the tourist department always coming, arranging everything for the, for the tourists to come. Sometimes they reconstruct, sometimes they don't reconstruct. If they do reconstruct, they can do it in different ways. Also those lines, if you remember in Megiddo, you remember how the line looked at Megiddo? Like a, a concrete line, you remember? You can do those things in, easy, uh, in different ways. Sometimes the reconstruction looks completely different than the original. Here they used exactly the same thing, so without this line you would never know what is original and what is replica, but uh, sometimes they do it completely different, so you don't really need the line because you see it with your own eyes what is new, what is not. Okay, I was hoping that until this point the other guys will arrive, but I see that they don't, so let's go here to another room. <laughs> Hello. One Israeli guy, one... no, no. Okay, guys, we are now, okay, everybody's in, we are now standing in the wine cellar. How do we know that? Because this little pit there in the corner. Back then, first of all, they didn't use bottles like we have today. They had big, very big jars or uh, uh, something to hold the wine. Uh, uh, they used different things in, uh, uh, in the ships. They have something a little different. There were different bottles, but let's say big jars like today made from uh, a pottery. But if one like that would be broken, a lot of liquid would go to waste. So no. In every room like that, they had a little pit so the liquid could go in and they, they could use it again. Now basically they could have here any kind of liquid, um, also water, 
but no, it was probably a uh, wine. They could have also uh, uh, oil, so it could be oil and wine, but we assume that it was probably the wine. <laughs> okay, guys, uh, let's go out. There is another model over there, and I see that there is a group. I want, when they leave, we'll go and grab it. Okay, guys, this is a model of the northern part of, uh, of the rock. We are... Guys, 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 come here, come here. It's just the morning, come closer to here. We, we just started, come on. <coughs> okay, we are, uh, we are just over here. And all those ones, everything that you see over here are warehouses warehouses that he needed because first of all he, uh, he wanted to get ready for a war over here so in the case of a war you need uh, uh, clothes you need the uh, uh, weapons you need tons of different things we'll see those warehouses in a minute they're really fascinating over here we have the palace you'll see it in a couple of minutes we'll go in near the original steps from here and we'll go to see it but there are three levels of the palace will be uh, uh, in this balcony we won't go down but you have the first the second the third this was probably used as a general room uh, uh, maybe his uh, uh, his uh, assistance room because actually it's divided to couple of them we have three over here and two over here and this is the corridor in the middle all that was something like a balcony also back then exactly like it is today uh, here was the dining room and here was his master bedroom in a way but also that we can't really know because even in your own house you're changing from time to time the living room and the uh, and the different rooms but this is what we believe today now you can see the stairs here from the side they were closed half and half open Half open, half closed, half open, half closed. Maybe he wanted, I don't know, to go in the middle of the night in, in uh, underwear <laughs> and walk around. But guys, you need to know that this palace was very, very safe. It means that no one could arrive from anywhere around. You see this trail? Ignore it, please. It's not, it's not, no, no, it was here, but it, it didn't lead up. Okay, it's something completely different because people see that and, and thinking that it's a way to get there. The only way to get to the palace is through the trail. You can, if you want to know exactly the steps and how long it takes, you can ask Sarah over here. And coming up and coming through here and going down to the palace. Okay. Now, just from that trail, donkeys by foot, uh, uh, different ways. I'll show you in a minute the Dead Sea, but take a look guys to the other side. You can see the mountains over there. The Dead Sea reached much, much higher. I'll show you in a minute how high it got. There were almost no boats at the Dead Sea. I like to say that there weren't at all, but I don't know if there weren't at all. Let's say that almost no boats. So for a case of a war, if a, an army wanted to cross, I don't know, with 5,000, 10,000 people, he couldn't bring three or five boats because then they will need two years to cross. So they just, they didn't bring so many, so many boats. They just came from the mountains from the other side. Okay. From over here, it's something like um, 40, 50 miles to get to Hebron. Even less. But everything is through the mountains over here. Everything is from the mountains over here. Now come with me here to the... Guys, you see the bus over there coming, that there is a small car that's uh, uh, driving a little bit uh, uh, up ahead. More or less to that point, the sea used to arrive. Okay, we're talking about 2000 years ago and actually also 100 years ago. So from here you couldn't really pass and from the palace in a couple of minutes we'll see also the north part, this is En Gedi. 
And after En Gedi, the water arrived all the way to the cliffs also in our side. So there was no road over there, no nothing. People could arrive or from the south or from the east or through the crossing the sea. That's it. Now you can see again the three camps that we saw before. One is the one. Guys, the guys that climbed up, I don't know if, maybe you saw it, but I don't know if you know what it is. Where we took the cable car, you can see one reconstructed camp. The square thing. This was the only one that was reconstructed, but there is another one. Sorry, come, 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 come. There is another one near the bus, uh, the, uh, uh, the bus parking, and there is another one on the left. So there are three over there. Don't worry, you'll see them uh, from also another point. Guys, the ones that can't uh, see. Yes, yes. Okay, guys, let's start going up. Uh, you know, before going up, go to the other side. There is a, a house over there with three rooms that we call it the villa. We call it the villa because basically, like you t I told you before, we have no idea who lived there. But you can see the frescoes inside. They're really gorgeous. Go, go with it. Take a look how long it is and take a look straight up. You can see this is another warehouse and another one and another one. This was exactly the way that we found here everything. On top of it, there was a lot of sand, but this is the way that we found so in some places like the wall that is behind you we reconstructed it some places like over here we left it like that okay we didn't reconstruct just made it a little stronger in some places we left it the way that it was standing for the last 2000 years because a very very simple reason everywhere that we are digging in israel we always trying to leave some parts for the next generations for the next uh, uh, archaeologists to come because basically things that we know today we didn't know 50 years ago and things that we think that we know today probably in 50 years we'll understand that we didn't know nothing. So we always leave different parts everywhere, everywhere, any archaeological hill that you have in Israel. Now look, even the warehouse, take a look behind you, he plastered. And it wasn't to preserve the food or anything like that because the roof was very, very simple or from hay or from wood because we didn't find here specifically any kind of arches. So it had to be something uh, very simple that also didn't last for 2000 years. So it wasn't to preserve the food or to keep the, the clothes or the weapons or I don't know what, just for the beauty. Okay, guys, our next station is the palace. Please follow me. But that didn't see it before the, uh, where we took the cable car and you can see near the parking lot of the buses another one a bigger one and a third one on the left now there is from the first one from the reconstructed one there is a wall that going all around all those three camps and this wall and there are also 64 towers down there that you can't really see from here but there exist it's a part of what the, the Romans built in the big rebellion. Now, if you'll continue with the wall, on the left down there, you can see another camp. Guys, for the ones, you can come up here and see it much, much better. Now, take a look to the north. There is a beautiful cloud sitting there. <laughs> yeah, the rain is coming toward us. Woohoo! Okay, but try to see past the rain. If you'll see where, no, no, really, where you'll see the, the sea is coming, uh, like the cliffs are coming all the way to the sea. A little bit before of that, there is a green spot. Not everybody can see. You know what, let's go to the balcony over there. We'll see it better. It's downstairs, right? Those camps, it's from the second period that I told you, sorry, from the third period that I told you about, from the big rebellion. And everything that was built up here is from the second period, from Herod's period. So again, when Herod was sitting here, he didn't have all those. But when the Romans were sitting downstairs and they needed to bring water, they needed to go all the way up there to En Gedi. It's something like 10 miles away and then coming back. Now, the people here on the rock didn't have any problem whatsoever with, uh, with water. They had here all the water that they needed. The situation down was completely different. Want to show you something? One minute, give me, please. So. Guys, guys, take a look over here, please. 
Guys, over here, over here. Take a look. This is the way that it looks if we had a chopper and we were standing in the air 100 feet straight up and looked on where we are. We are standing here, okay, in this balcony. This picture was taken a long, long time ago, but still it didn't change so much. This is the first floor, the second floor, the third floor. This was the way that it looked in the time of Herod. Okay? Everybody see it? Now, guys, Herod, more than anything, he loved to show off. <laughs> really. He wanted that anyone that will come here from the east, from the west, from the north, the first thing that you'll see will be this palace. Like, look what I made. Okay? He was a, a chauvinist. He was also a chauvinist. He wasn't actually actually a chauvinist. He killed his wives exactly like he killed everybody else. He didn't have any problem also killing his wives. see the walking closet. The frescoes that you saw already and the plaster on the wall. But more than that, I want to show you those aisles, these floors, okay? You see the triangle kind of thing. Those floors, and it's about Pakiraka. Uh, those floors were found only in two places around the world. Here and in the city of Pompeii. Really? Yes. Now, it means that you wanted to be in the first in everything, and those were very, very expensive. Now, take a look down here. It looks like someone actually pulled them out. You say what I mean? Someone actually did. Who, when, and why, I'll tell you later. Now continue. This room, this part over here is a replica, but it's still just to show you how those things were done. And again, you remember it was uh, yesterday. The, the floor level was over here. Okay, this was the floor level. Underneath there were those columns. They held the floor. Outside, behind those glasses, we had a, a fire that the hot air came in under the floor. But here, unlike uh, Betchan, we have also those red things. It's called tubulis. You remember I told you that also yesterday in Betchan that you need it. Here they, also here they didn't need it, but here they wanted to have it, that's it. Here it's also, it's the same temperature as like in Betchan. But you see, those are empty. They're, uh, there's nothing inside. So the hot air went also through the wall, also under the floor. A steam room. No. You can see the original tubuli over there behind uh, that um, pile of, uh, of stones and between the wall to that and also over there. You can see that there is a gap between that and the wall. Those are broken tubuli just like those ones. Again, this is uh, not original. But guys, take a look at the ceiling, please. You see that it's like an arch. Do we have any idea why it's like that? Why it's built like that? So it was a steam room, right? It was a, a sauna. By the way, not a dry sauna, a hot sauna. Uh, sorry, not a dry sauna, a wet sauna. And when you're sitting in a, in, a, in a wet sauna, the drops going up, and then they get stuck on the, uh, on the ceiling. And then what happened? Exactly, but if you have a ceiling like that, it's going to the side. After all, if Herod is supposed to sit here, he don't want drops on his head, right? It destroys all the fun, so it goes to the side. They thought of everything. They thought of everything. So this is a fire pit, and the canal right there is for water to heat up and warm up and humidify the sauna. Storage of what? Oil. Oil or or wine, exactly. You see the pits in the middle, right? For the ones that weren't with me from the beginning. They had in different warehouses a pit in the middle of the storage room for a case that the liquid, the, the jar, the, uh, uh, the clay jar will break and then the liquid could go into the, the pit and then they could use it again. It was used or for wine or for oil. Here they probably used both. Until this point, I'm talking, I was talking only about the period of Great Herod. Do you remember three periods? Uh, about the Hashmonais, we don't talk uh, uh, so much over here. We just don't have anything uh, to see from their period. We spoke mostly about Herod. But everything that we saw around is from the big rebellion.
So now I want to talk to you a little bit about the Big Rebellion. But before I'll do that, I want to tell you even why it's called the Big Rebellion. The rebellion against, uh, against Rome started actually in the north. The rebellions back then started because of different uh, reasons. But one of the most important reasons were the fact that people were supposed to give taxes to the big empire. Today it works a little bit different. If, let's say, generally speaking, the US is the big empire around the world, you guys are giving us the small place money. But if we would live 2,000 years ago, we were supposed to give you guys money. And of course, you know that no one likes to pay taxes. So the problems usually started with, because of money. They started also because of other reasons. Uh, I don't want to get into it. There were different uh, uh, reasons, but this was one of the most important one of them. And the rebellion started. The Romans, uh, uh, the Romans came from, from Europe, obviously, from Rome, and came from the north of Israel. One of the first places that they stopped in was a place called Yodfat. They tried to conquer Yodfat. The general over there was a guy by the name of Yosef ben Matityahu. And he tried to fight the, the Romans, but he couldn't. So in some point, he gathered around all the people over there uh, in Yodfat, and he told them, listen, we are going to lose this uh, uh, battle. Let's make a suicide. About the, uh, the suicide issue, we'll talk later on because we have a couple of points more to touch uh, that part. Anyway, they decided that they're all going to make a suicide. Everybody started killing each other. In the end, only two people were left, him and another guy. And then he thought to himself, he looked up, he saw that it's a beautiful day, and he thought, you know, I'm not sure that I want to kill myself today. So he came to the Romans and he told them, listen, I want to become an historian. I want to become a Roman. Please don't kill me. Let me live. Let me go with you wherever you go. I want to write about this period of time. Now, you can say about this guy whatever you want. You can say that he was a traitor and a bad person and everything you want, everything is true. But thanks to this guy, we know that everything that happened in that period of time, he wrote about the war because he actually continued walking with the Romans wherever they went. He wrote also about the general period of time. We are talking about only 30 years after the time of Jesus. So it's true that he didn't write specifically about Jesus, but he wrote about the period. Uh, uh, he wrote about John the Baptist. He, he wrote about different things that are very important for us. And those books were last, and we have them until today. He also changed his name. To what he's changed it to? Josephus. All right. So guys, uh, uh, the rebellion started in 66, in the year 70. They reached Jerusalem, they destroyed Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple. In the winter of 74, they came here to Masada. We used to think that it was in 73. Uh, we think today that it was in 74. Maybe until next time that you arrive here, the archaeologists will decide that it's 75. But anyway, it, uh, uh, the winter of 74, really, it's, it's crazy, it sounds silly. But things that happened 2,000 years ago are being changing all the time. And remind me... Uh, about that. Tell me about King Herod and the Welling Wall. I'll tell you something on the bus that we discovered just lately. Anyway, uh, in the winter of 74, they came up here. By the way, why in the winter? Why the Romans came here, especially in the winter? Because exactly, even for them, it was too hot in the summer. So anyway, they came here. They built all this wall around and the camps and the towers. I told you that there were towers. You can't really see the towers uh, from up here today, only from downstairs. But Josephus wrote that they built here 64 towers. When the archaeologists came here and they started digging, they thought, okay, we'll find more or less. We found exactly 64 towers. Everything that he wrote was accurate in 100%. Anyway, they built all those things. And then they thought, okay, now we need to climb up. So how we are going to do that? So they built a ramp. We didn't see that ramp yet. It's exactly on the opposite side from what there, uh, from where that we climbed up, or some of us climbed up. And uh, then they built a mobile tower made from wood, and they pushed it up all the way to the wall. And then they tried to break the wall, and they hit the wall, and it was broken. So the rebels here, the gazelles, thought, okay, what can we do really, really uh, quickly? So they rebuilt the the wall, but they couldn't do it from uh, from rock. The idea was to build it from wood, because the wood is more elastic, so when you're hitting it, it's, it's harder to break it, in a way. And then the Romans had an idea of the, uh, their own. The 
they thought to themselves, why won't we just burn down this part of the wall? So they fired on it uh, um, arrows with uh, uh, fire. In some point, the wind almost burned their own uh, tower. Now, the rebels here were very happy when they saw it starts happening. Why is that? We are in the middle of the desert. I assume that you noticed that there is no wood over here. They thought that if the tower will actually be burned down until the Romans will bring more wood, it was almost the end of the winter. They assumed that they're earning at least another season or two until the Romans will come back here. But in some point, the wind changed direction uh, back and the wall was burned down. And all that happened in the evening time. Now, the Romans back then, they were pagans. They uh, were afraid to uh, fight in the dark. They believed that they are bad spirits, so they waited until the morning. When they climbed here in the morning, we have our friend again. <laughs> so guys, when they climbed up here in the morning, they found everybody here dead. Everybody here committed suicide. And if I'll do it really quickly, every father took care in a way to his own family. Then people started killing each other. In some point, there were only 10 people were left. And they decided to make a lottery who will stay last and will fall on his sword. So they wrote their names on pieces of clay. Now, we don't really know today who won or lost in this lottery. You know, it depends how you look at it. But we found those pieces of clay of lots in the room that is just behind us. We have it uh, until today in the, in the museum. Any questions, guys, so far? And don't ask me when the weather is going to change. I'm cold also. I'm telling you, it's the first time that I'm cold on Masada. But it's fun. It keeps me sharp. OK, let's carry on, guys. We'll continue our room. Now, it basically means that when the guards are going for a watch or something before their shift, they're sitting here and, I don't know, drinking their tea after they just woke up. From a guy that was in the, in the army for three years, I can tell you that usually this room is the simplest room in the base. Okay, you were in the base a couple of days ago, you saw that it's very simple and I'm using easy words. This was the worst one. Even the guard room, he plastered. But not just the plaster. Guys, I want you to have a look on this plaster. I know, can you move a little bit so everybody will see? Yeah, go a little bit to the back. Guys, take a look. Uh, Today it doesn't look exactly like that, but you'll understand it after I'll tell you. This is a special technique. The idea was that it, this is a plaster, but it will look like marble, like uh, plates of marble. So that's one and another one, and you can see they're also in the back. It was, again, special technique that just started around that period of time. Okay, everybody... Ah, I for Okay. I skipped a couple of them. Okay, guys, please, let's carry on. Now, the water was brought up here with different kinds of donkeys and murals from halfway down to cistern just like this one here on the rock. Now, first of all, this cistern, all of it is uh, original, except a couple of really smart people that thought that it would be really neat to write their names over there on the wall, except that everything here is original. It's a little deeper than you can see. But how the water was road down there this is what we are going to see right now guys yesterday when we were walk when we uh, had the bus going down to the dead sea i know that half of you were sleeping but i spoke a little bit about the flash floods that we have over here you remember there is almost no rain here but even if there is rain 30, 40 miles away from here on the mountains, everything comes down here. And because of the, uh, of the material, of the ground, of the soil, it doesn't take the, the water in. So everything comes down in flash floods. I also told you that it's the more, the, one of the main things that's feeding also the Dead Sea. And to, today we are catching most of this water. So we have here different kinds of wadis. Wadi, it's like a dry river. And where we have those dry rivers, when we have the flash flood, they are not so dry. They're very, very wet. Now we have one over there that is called the River of Masada, or the Wadi of Masada. And over there on the other side, there is another Wadi by the name of Benyair. 
Herod knew about those two uh, wadis. He knew that the rain, when the flash flood is coming, it's coming very, very fast. And what that he did was building two aqueducts, one from that river, another one from the other one that took the water here. And now they are finished, thank God. The one. What the King Herod did was building up 12 cisterns over here. Eight he built up, four he built down. Now, when there was actually a flash flood, what that happened was that with those aqueducts, it brought the water to the cistern. And he had a soldier that he sent him really, really fast down when this, the flash flood actually started. And he was standing here and then he made sure that the first cistern is getting full. And then the second, and then the third. One flash flood was enough to fill up everything. Now, just that you'll understand, you saw the cistern over there, right? The smallest cistern that we have down is three times bigger than this one. They're huge. Now, when all of them were full and one flash flood was enough, to fill up all of them. It was enough for 1,000 people to live here for three years. Now, from those ones, you can see the trail over here. They brought the water up through a gate just near the guard room where we stopped a minute ago, and they filled up, you see, this trail? Yeah, exactly, with donkeys, with mules, horses, uh, whatever they had. They went automatically in a way. There was someone that sent them from down and they came up by themselves, went down by themselves, and they filled up all the cisterns that we have here on Masada. Anyone saw a movie that is called Masada? Yeah. There is an old movie called Masada. Okay. In that movie, there is a part that uh, the Romans are sitting down and they almost don't have any water because they need to bring it all the time from uh, Engedi. You remember I told you in the palace they need to go 10 miles back and forth and they're thirsty actually to drink, but the people here, the rebels, they have here all the water that they want. And there is one case over there that they're working like a, um, a what's the word, like menthol uh, uh, taro in a way they're doing for the Romans down. They were swimming here in the cistern and in some point they decided that the water smells funny. So they just let the water go down like wasted and because they, they, they had so much water, but the people down saw the water being spilled. They couldn't catch it. It was very fast, but they didn't even have water to drink. Because here, Herod didn't have any problem with water. Now, uh, someone asked me before how they grew here uh, food, how they had here food. So when you have water, it's much, much easier. But you need to understand that there wasn't here a real city. After the period uh, that Herod built this place. When I'm saying Herod, you understand that I don't even mean that Herod actually came and put the stones one on top of the other. His uh, uh, men did that. And when they finished, they left here very, very small uh, group of people. They just preserved the place. In the big rebellion, they didn't build here infrastructures for to stay here for a long time. They didn't know exactly how long it will take, but some of the things that grew here on the, uh, on the rock, some uh, they went behind that hill, there is a valley over there, but even there, they fixed for themselves a place that they held some water over there, but there isn't a spring, only from the flash flood, they uh, arranged for themselves a place to catch the water and then they could uh, grow things, but that's it. Most of the things were grown here on the rock, in a very, very simple way. Again, we're not talking about a village or about a, a, a city, we're talking about a case of a war, a situation of a war zone. Any questions that were found in Israel? I spoke about it a little bit when we were in Capernaum, but just a couple words, uh, uh, other words about that. But first of all, this synagogue is one of the only structures that we have today that were built actually in the time of the Big Rebellion. In the time of Herod, the structure was used, believe it or not, as the barn or the stables. Why is that? The cistern is just over here. The animals that brought the water up, they had, they needed a, a room for the night, let's say. So that was the room. We just found under the floor a lot of manure. 
when we dicked. But the rebels needed here, as Jewish people, they needed a synagogue. So they built the synagogue. And synagogues back then were used completely for a different way than today. Today we are going to pray three times a day and we have different things that we need to do. You have here a rabbi that can tell you a lot about that. Back then, when the temple was exist, we used synagogues for a completely different uh, uh, reason. It was more of a gathering place. In uh, Greek, actually, it means a gathering place. Because they used to sit here, they read the Torah. The reading of the Torah is something that started 2,500 years ago in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, 2,400 years ago. And since then, we read, we read the Torah three times a week, Mondays, Thursdays, Saturdays. But I don't remember actually from the beginning it was also in Saturday. I'm not sure about that. But anyway, we read the Torah and that was the main reason. After the temple was destroyed, started the whole idea that we need to pray three times a day. And we started doing different things because the whole concept of the sacrificing uh, was gone. There is no temple, so we can't make uh, uh, sacrifices. So uh, this is a synagogue and you'll go in by yourselves in a minute uh, because there are other groups inside. But this is exactly the way that the synagogue used to look in that period with the benches all around. And the room that is still exists over there is called Cheder Gniza. The Jewish people, if you have a Bible in your house or a, a, a scroll of the Torah and it's getting bad, like uh, destroyed in a way, you don't throw it. We don't throw it. We put it in the Gniza. How you say Gniza in uh, like a room to, to like burying it in a way, uh, storage room in a way, okay? And uh, in every synagogue we have storage rooms just like that. Over here, because of the importance of Masada, there was a rabbi that decided two years ago that he wants to sit over here and starts writing the, the, the scrolls of the Torah. It called Sofer Stam this job because until today we are writing everything by hand and he can't make any mistake when he's writing those scrolls because if he's making even one letter or one line a mistake he needs to throw the page and write it uh, uh, start it all over i don't know if he's here or not because he don't have a exact schedule but go in take a look if the door over there is open if it is go in don't bother him too much you can take pictures you can see him writing or the scrolls of the Torah or uh, the scroll of the mezuzah or tefillin. You'll see if it's big or small. Take a look. In, out. Good luck. Go, go, go. Oh, sir, come on. You'll be fine. We're almost done. Everybody's here, no? Yes. Greg? Yeah. Guys, be with me, please. Come, come, come closer. Come closer. I want you to see the ramp. That's why I'm standing here. The ramp was built here in the middle, down there. And you can see both sides. Wow! What's the ramp? This is the ramp of... <laughs> <laughs> you know what, guys? Take a look on the ramp. We are going here to the side to talk. Okay, it stopped. Okay, it stopped. The wind heard me, so... No. That's... This is what the Romans built when they came here. I hope that the wind will stop so you'll be able to see it again in a minute. So, they built that, they built the, the wooden uh, tower, they pushed it all the way to just where that I was standing. And then they tried to break the wall. You can see also over there how the wall is broke and also in this side. Okay, exactly where the group now is standing, both sides, it's broken. Then the rebels here built the wooden one and the rest of the story you guys already know. Now. The story of Masada is very important for us as Jewish people and especially as Israeli people, as Zionists. Because we have a saying today that Masada will never fall down again because it's exactly like the state of Israel. Those people tried to fight for their freedom 2000 years ago. And it's true that they lost. They lost. But they lost in their terms. And they started all that to get freedom. And today, if you're losing in a battle, usually unless you're falling in the hands of Assad or something, uh, you're going to jail. Maybe in some point you'll be released, maybe not. But uh, you can continue in a way maybe to uh, live your life. Back then, you became a slave. 
when you uh, lost a war for the rest of your life. In the good case, in the worst case, you were just being killed. So uh, those people decided that they're going to do that in their case. And it's true that uh, uh, making a suicide, it's against the Judaism. But in this situation, in this rebel, in this war, it was in a way a little different. Because for them it was fighting to their death. And if they're losing, they're going to lose it in their own terms. And at least not to let the Romans win. Now when the Romans actually climbed up here, and they saw that everybody are dead, they were pissed. They were very, very angry. Why is that? They basically lost their winning prize. They lost their winning prize, so they tried to grab from here whatever they could. So they found some gold from Herod's period. They took the floors in the uh, bathhouse like we saw before because it was worth a lot of money. Whatever they could put their hands on, they took. Now, today there are even troops from the military, troops like we saw yesterday, that coming here to pray oath to the state of Israel because of the importance of this place. Exactly like we don't have any other place. We don't have. This is the only place for us. Exactly like Masada for them back then, it was the last point. And yet they lost, they lost in their terms. We are here to stay. We're not going anywhere. We'll do whatever we need to stay here. And we will stay here. With help with our friends. Friends like you guys. Friends like Jewish people that we have all over the world. A Christians that we have all over the world that helping us. We are helping them the way that we can. You are helping us the way that you can. And we'll be here, I hope, that forever. Now, guys, when we started digging here, we found here 28 remains that we believe that are remains of people from the time of the big rebellion. We buried them over there in a minute. I'll show you where this hill. Downstairs, there is like a hill that we called it the hill of the tombs. We buried them there in like a full military uh, uh, service, like they were a part of the IDF. Okay, uh, the, the uh, military uh, rabbi came here, it, it was a very, very big uh, uh, thing back then. And because for us, they were just a part of the IDF. Any questions, guys? Something that I skipped? Nothing. Yes. Uh, 60 something, 68 or 72, or 68 or 72, I don't remember, but a uh, long time ago. What in the time of the Maccabees? Also in the time of the Maccabees, but I didn't talk anything about the time of the Maccabees because we don't have any remains from their period of time. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, Actually, about that, guys, we use, actually today we believe that it's not. Yeah, for, but for many years it was true. For many years we used to think, again, also today they're changing their mind all the time. And, but today they're believing because different things that they found, different remains that they found uh, 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 down that it's not uh, a Jewish slaves. But for many years we believe that it were Jewish slaves that built the ramp because the rebels from here threw all the time things down there. Also, I'm going back to the uh, movie Masada. In Masada, you can even see that and how they threw with the Rogatka on the wall different Jewish people that uh, uh, the rebels here will give up. But today, we believe that the, the, those Jewish people, those slaves, were used only to bring the water back and forth all the time. And the Romans actually built it. And actually today we think that it was much quicker. It took them the whole round, something like a month, between some say even two weeks to three months that it took them to build everything down, uh, down until they actually conquered this place. We used to think that it took them more than a year. Oh. Uh, uh, things, been, things that happened 2,000 years ago. Uh, being changed all the time. Okay, guys, we're going down there to see a whole different period of time. I didn't talk with you about a completely different period of time. In the 5th century, came to Masada a group of monks that opened here Laura. Laura is like a monastery, a silent monastery. The monks didn't talk about themselves, between themselves. Every monk sat down in different point, a different uh, uh, 
station or a house here on Masada. They met only once a week for a joint meal on Friday. Some say that they spoke in that meal, some say that they don't. But anyway, we are standing now inside the church that they built. Almost everything here is original except the wood, uh, the roof over there. Almost everything that you see around you is actually original. Go here and take a look on the mosaic floor uh, over here. It's gorgeous. And then continue from here out and we're going back to the cable. We're in the synagogue of Engedi, but before I'll tell you about the synagogue, I want to tell you generally about Engedi. We are in the desert, you know that we are in the desert, uh, the desert of Judea. And there is no, except Engedi, there isn't any other spring in this area. That's why, also today, you have almost no villages around here, but also through the history, the main village was only here. Sometimes it was smaller, sometimes it was bigger. But we know in at least 4,000 years back, there were different villages over here. This place is also mentioned in the Bible with a very famous story about King Saul and King David. In that point, uh, David wasn't the king yet. But uh, uh, a little bit about uh, the story as it's written in the Bible. So the story says that Saul was the king of Israel, you know that, and he was good king, but let's say that he wasn't the best king, or he was good, but he was good in 98%, not in 100%. And God decided because of those 2% not to continue his dynasty. Now, this was the only time in the kingdom, back then it was the United Kingdom of Israel and Judea, was that later became two kingdoms. But anyway, the continuance also of Judea, there was never any case that the new king knew that he is going to be a king before the old one passed away. Here we had a very unique situation that David already knew that he's going to be the next king and uh, so also heard about it that his dynasty is not going to continue. So he was very angry. And when the king is very angry, he's doing crazy things. So he wanted to kill David. And he looked for him in different places. In some point, he heard that he's hiding here in Engedi. So he followed him, or he came after him here to Engedi. He looked for him in different places. Uh, in some point, uh, the sun uh, uh, came down, and they went to sleep in one of the caves. Him with, his, uh, uh, with the soldiers, with his soldiers. In the middle of the night, David came to him, and very very quietly came into the the cave and his friends David's friends told him kill him kill him like about Saul but then he said no I'm not going to kill anyone uh, he's still the king he had the respect for the king but what that he did do he took a piece of his cloth of his shirt and then in the morning when Saul came out maybe to brush his teeth or something in the creek uh, David called up to him from the from one of the cliffs around. So, can you hear me? Look, I came to you last night. I could have killed you if I wanted to. Here, look, I, I took a piece of your, your shirt. So Saul understood that he was wrong, and he went back to uh, uh, to his capital, to near Shiloh back then. Uh, it was in Jerusalem yet. Either he tried to kill David again, but that's another story. Okay, now about this synagogue, the people here of Engedi, through time, here this synagogue was built between the 3rd and the 6th century, actually the way that you see it right now, it was reconstructed again in the 6th century, but uh, the village here was very, very wealthy. They held a secret, how to make the perfume of, uh, from the mare and the Frankenstein. Generally about the mare and the Frankenstein, uh, uh, those uh, uh, two perfumes, two uh, uh, incense came from the area of uh, Yemen, of the Ethiopia, and uh, they were brought up to Europe before the, the Byzantine period started, because when they were pagans, when you have a sacrifice inside a temple, inside a temple, it's causing a bad smell. So uh, it became a very, very big industry. Over here, they actually made the perfume like we are using today. And it was a very big secret, but they made tons of money out of it. So the synagogue here and the mosaic floor, I told you already that I love it uh, uh, very much, but you have here different things written 
in Hebrew. Uh, let me look for the one that I want to show you. I don't remember where it's written. One second. I think that over here. Uh, no, this is their blessing like the person that gave donation uh, to the place. I'm looking for a place that it's written. Ah, here, sorry. Uh, they're actually cursing the person that will reveal the secret of the town about the perfume. A little higher, you have a list of the names uh, of all the generations uh, uh, from Adam. You see Adam, Se, Enosh, Kainan, uh, uh, is going on and on and on. Uh, in the middle, in the middle, usually around that time, they used to have the fortunes, the, uh, how it's called, the, um, what's the name? Zodiac. Zodiac, sorry. The Zodiac with the uh, king, uh, the sun, um, um, the god of the sun and everything. Uh, in the middle of it, here they had uh, something a little different. If you'll go uh, up there, you know what, go up there. I'll stand here and I'll show you a couple more things. Come on, come on, come on. Go up there, you'll see it much, much, much better. Whoa, okay, that's not good. I have to use this here? It, it, gets, a little, yeah, it gets a little windy. Hold on. All over the world, it's true that we are praying toward the east, but it's not toward the east. It's not because of the east. It's because of Jerusalem. We're praying toward Jerusalem. Now, we are now in the Holy Land. We are south of Jerusalem. So, where we are supposed, which direction we are supposed to pray to? Toward the north, right? Jerusalem is up there. So, the ark was over there, where you see the stage uh, area, the Bama, number 10 over there. So this is where the ark was. You can see the menorahs, three menorahs over there also. And this is where the people prayed. Now, exactly like you see the benches, we saw it uh, an hour ago in, uh, in Masada. You remember? You went out to the, into the uh, synagogue. Over there it was from all the directions. Here probably there were also seats in the middle. But uh, the praying was toward Jerusalem. And by the way, tell me something. If you're inside Jerusalem, which direction you're praying to? Good question. What is so special? Exactly, the temple. So the, the temple is not exist, so the temple mount. Or to the welling wall. Okay, it's uh, uh, basically the same idea. So if it's around the world or the Holy Land or uh, inside Jerusalem, uh, it's a little bit different. But <coughs> the stage was over there. The rabbi used to stand here, over here, in the middle. You know, the, uh, I'm saying rabbi, but actually in the Judaism, there is no a big significance in the synagogue for the rabbi. It means that every person can come up and read the Torah or read the, uh, to pray with everybody. We're praying all together. Today I can do it, tomorrow you can do it. There is no significance. It's a very big respect, very big honor. They're not letting any, everyone uh, go there, but you don't need to be a rabbi uh, uh, like Joel here. Okay? That's uh, uh, generally speaking. Now, guys, everything that you see around you is original. And all the mosaics, by the way, in Israel, mosaic, we never, uh, we never make a replica, except one place... Um, a church in the north in Tabcha. We didn't. Uh, uh, we weren't there, but generally, <coughs> we don't uh, make any replicas of uh, of uh, a mosaic floor. Never. We leave it the same. We're making it a little stronger, but that's about uh, that's about it. Okay, guys, go from all the directions, and you can see on the other side there were a couple of other rooms uh, over there. Again, they used for Gniza, exactly like we saw in Masada, to leave the scrolls that uh, uh, we can't use, that were too, uh, too bad to uh, turn down, turned uh, off. You want to read something before we continue? Okay, so don't go. We There's a lesson here, obviously, and Pastor Greg's going to expound on the lesson um, on why 
David was fleeing from Saul, and, but there's the beginning of the story, which I don't think we've covered yet, and we find it in 1 Samuel chapter 7. Uh, this was not God's will, but we find that the elders of Israel gathered together, came to Samuel, you'll recall the story at Ramah, and said to him, look, you are old, your sons don't walk in your ways, make us a king to judge us like all the nations. So here we see again the Jewish people wanting to be like the nations and to assimilate and to be like them. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. And so Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And we pick it up and later on in 1 Samuel 7, and it says, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, for they said, No, but we will have a king over us, that we may also be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. That was our first mistake as a people. And so before we get here with Samuel and, or with, with David, that's the kind of the, the background of this. Pastor? Okay, that's the background of Come over closer. I'm, I'm going to sit down. Um, there's a big heart difference. God always works from the inside out, right? There's a big heart difference. When he chooses David, what does he say? He's a man after God's own heart. Was, he, was David perfect? Never. I mean, he committed adultery. He murdered somebody, but the grace of God was always there. The Holy Spirit was always exhibited in the life of, of David. He hosted the Spirit of God for a whole generation in the tabernacle of David. He's the guy who got it right and brought the ark back as it should have been. Uh, when David was here, and our guide said it so perfectly, Ophir talked about how that he had an opportunity to kill this guy who's harassing him. He knows he's the king. He's already been anointed to be the king. He's already taken care of the big guy, Goliath. Right. And so um, what's to stop him? Well, what's to what's to stop him is his respect for authority, his respect for God. Even though God had rejected Saul, God had allowed Saul to be. So therefore, it goes back to that verse of touch not mine anointed to do my prophets no harm. He was going to make sure that uh, he wasn't going to be guilty of touching God's anointed. He. Um, Matter of fact, if you read the scriptures, and I encourage you to do it sometime when you get home, he repented. He felt terrible even for cutting his clothes. He said, I shouldn't have even done that. That was too far. Shouldn't have gone that far. And that's something I think that we need to learn in our own lives, which each one of us is the temple of the Lord. Now, each one of us um, has the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwelling in us, is we need to learn to respect that and to respect the leaders that God has appointed and put in our lives. And, and I know that's the biggest frustration for me, and sometimes that's the biggest frustration for you, and I'm sure it's the biggest frustration for your pastor is, is you know, I want to be like David. Does that mean I do everything right? No. But I want to be quick to repent, quick to forgive, and quick to be the guy who will take the high road. And I think that's the thing that we need to learn and take from this um, that David um, took the high road. There was um, a couple other things that I want to, anytime I do a tour or a group to Israel, I always try to talk about what has happened in the past, what's happening now, and what's going to happen. So Joel and I were looking at some things concerning uh, the Dead Sea, and uh, we didn't really talk about them, but when we were at Masada a while ago, it was so nuts and crazy, I didn't want to say anything up there, but Nobody's pushing us and pressuring us here. You know, there was a, there was a phrase, uh, Eleazar, right, was the, the guy? Yeah. Um, and, and matter of fact, if you want to share about him, this would be a good time. No, go ahead. Go ahead, and I'll finish up with that. Because it ties, you know, uh, this whole trip from Philadelphia, where um, our founding fathers met, and right down the street was a Hebrew congregation. I don't know if you ever knew this. Right down the street is a Hebrew congregation at the same time that our founding fathers met. And so the tie between the United States and Israel 
always has been and I pray now always will be. Um, I talked to you back then about uh, the second president of the United States, John Adams, made the comment um, they, were, they were wanting to build a homeland for the Jewish people in this new country of America. And John Adams said, no, I wish above all things, and all of you, he said, I wish above all of you, I'm paraphrasing his quote, that the Jewish people had a homeland again of their own, but he said it has to be in Judea. That was the word he used. Well, that was said um, right after our Constitution, because that was the big push and the big move. Let's create a homeland for the Jewish people. He said, I would love that more than anybody. Well, we can't do it here because it's not supposed to be here. It's supposed to be in Jerusalem. When was it 1776? This was 1776. This has been after this. Been after the. Declaration of Independence. The Constitution was, what, then ratified around 1791? And so this statement would have been right after that, right before 1800. And so there's our founding fathers. You know Haim Solomon, um, and he founded and funded the uh, army for, for Washington. So the ties go way back. When we fought um, right after our revolution, um, the Barbary pirates, the reason we have a Marine Corps is we were fighting Islam in 1776 um, to the shores of Tripoli. You've heard that. We were fighting um, the Barbary pirates of North Africa, which were Muslim sultans that were causing problems for us as a new nation. I mean, so this fight that we have right now in America, the fight that Israel has right now, for us, for them, it goes back thousands of years. For us, it goes back, what, 230-something years. But it's the same fight, and it's the same enemy. And this is why we're linked together, because it's not a natural fight, although it's playing out in the natural. It's a spiritual fight, and it's a covenant fight. And um, so that's why there can't be any separation or daylight between um, Christian and Jew, between America and Israel. And so when I look at what our founding fathers went through, they were just as committed as the people in Masada. Our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor. Most of them lost everything. They were willing to put it all on the line, to die if they must, to be free men instead of being uh, slaves to tyranny. And so Masada also reminds me, and it's not anywhere equivalent to what the Israeli people did there, but it reminds me that same spirit and that same attitude, I would rather die a free man than to live a slave. Now, you and I live as free men based upon a spiritual relationship that we have because somebody was willing to die in our place. And so that means something to me there. This means something to me here within Getty. There are some verses, though, concerning the Dead Sea and what will happen in the Dead Sea. We call it the Dead Sea now because nothing lives there, right? Why is that? The salt content. You want to share that? And then I'll follow up with the verse. Uh, why there is nothing? Except that today there are, uh, there is 33.7% salt inside the Dead Sea. And it's not regular salt like you have in your kitchen. It's different kinds of salts and minerals. And uh, it's the third saltiest, most saltiest uh, uh, lake in the world, and I'm calling it a lake because it's disconnected, it's not uh, connected to anything. How it became, he's going to read it for you in a second, but because of that nothing can live there, not even bacteria, nothing, nothing, nothing uh, can survive over there, because it's dropping in specific places that there are springs, uh, small springs that coming out, so you can see a little bit of plants near the near the uh, coastline, but it's only because of the fresh water that's coming out. Over there, nothing uh, can live. So tell them where Zoar is, the, the little town. Zoar, the no, Zoar is where, what, you're, Zoar is where the hotels, where we are, the hotels, Neve Zoar. Okay. What you, about what we spoke yesterday on the bus? Oh, uh, I don't know if I'll go. No, no you, may, you may talk about because what we said on the bus is a little crazy. Yeah, yeah still. But it's, it's right, but it's crazy. He won't be able to verify or certify it as an official guide of Israel, even though it's the truth. Okay, um, let's see. Um, here we go in Genesis chapter number 13. 
Uh, Lot also went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell there, for their possessions were so great they could not dwell together. That's a pretty cool thing to be that blessed, huh? And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Perizzites then dwelt in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Sounds like David, huh? Is not the whole land before you. Please separate from me. If you want to take the left, then I'll go to the right. If you want to go to the right, then I'll go to the left. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before, and it says here in parentheses, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. So now where's, what's the garden of the Lord? Eden. So he looked out here, and it was so beautiful, it, it looked like the Garden of Eden. Then Lot chose for himself, well, it says right here, I'm sorry, like the Garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go toward Zoar. Now, where's Zoar? Where our hotels are. So when he looked out, the Jordan would be emptying into this. So when he looked out, he saw where the Jordan was. This was not here. This salt sea was not here all the way down to Zoar, and it was beautiful. It was like the Garden of Eden. And so Lot chose that. So back then, this was not like that. So what happened? Well, it gives you a clue right there. Has something to do with Sodom and Gomorrah. Has something to do with that. Let me go on. And that's all I'll say about that part until I come back and do some study on my own. I'll do it also. You're going with me? That's we'll a go deal. wherever you want. That's a deal. I'm with you. Okay, so you get over here to Ezekiel and listen to what's going to happen. Now, this isn't a book of Revelation prophecy. This is the book of Ezekiel, right? In Ezekiel, it says, he said, Ezekiel 47, he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? And then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. When I returned, there along the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and the other. Then he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley, and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the rivers go, will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters go there, for they will be healed. And everything will live wherever the river goes. It, sh it shall be that the fishermen will stand by it from En Gedi. Where are we? From En Gedi to, how do you say this word? Eglaim. Eglaim. I don't know where that is. Eglaim, it's a little bit more to the south. Uh, from En Gedi, yeah. Um, a little bit southern than uh, even Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. Um, then there will be places where they will spread their nets. Their fish will be the same, as, the same kind as many fish of the Great Sea, exceedingly many. But his swamps and marshes will not be healed. They will be, they will be given over to the salt. Along the banks of the river on this side and on that will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water that flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. So it started off bad. This, I love the way God works because he's always consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. It started off beautiful like the Garden of Eden, I believe, because of Sodom and Gomorrah and the judgment that came. It is now like you see it now. I believe that it's drying up, preparing for it to come back, right? That's what I believe. I believe it is drying up in preparation for the water that will flow again. And, the, and I love this. The waters will be healed. Huh? The waters will be healed. So when does this happen? This happens, this happens in, in the, when the Messiah comes. In the Messianic reign. When the Messiah comes to Israel again, the waters will flow from the Temple Mount, from Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, and it will heal the waters, and it will be just like it was back in the time of Abram. So past, present, and future. Anything? Back to the bus. Back to the bus.